Today I'm speaking to David Henley who is a proud science fiction and fantasy geek. He's worked in the publishing industry for quite some time in Australia doing everything from producing, editing, podcasting to writing books. Hello David. Hello Nelly. So I've been researching you on the internet. Oh dear. I'm aware of Terence Bumbley yep. and I'm aware of David Henley. Yep. But actually there's not very much information about you that I could find on the internet. So I want you to imagine that I'm Pierre Junior, your character from your latest novels, and I'm going to probe your brain. You know everything already. <laughs> and I'm going to be invisible while I'm probing your brain because I'm Pierre Junior. Okay, so David, how old are you? That, all right, I am 35 turning 36 this year. Yeah? My, my birthday's in December. Well, happy birthday in December. Thank you. Um, and are you married? I am married. I'm married to a lovely lady called Alice Drenby. Yep. Um, so we don't share the same name, so that's another misdirection for you. Where, where did you go to school? And, and kind of like, what are your Which qualifications? School? Qualifications for what? Yeah, well. For That's which thing? Um, well, I was born in New Zealand and I went to Taupo Primary School. You don't sound like a Kiwi. Well, I had one year in America in, I can't remember, 1984, I think. I was four years old. No, that's not right. It must be 1982. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, I was in America for a year and so I seem to have picked up an American accent. Mm. Though both my parents are from Somerset in England, so they think it's actually a bit of that Somerset R's that I haven't, I can't seem to drop. So whenever I say girl or world, you can go, well, who is, what is it you're talking about? But it's funny, I was at a party the other day and I just said hello to someone and they went, are you from America? I was like, I said hello. How did you, how did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then so we came over here and I grew up in Canberra and went to Aranda Primary School and then I went to Canberra High School and then I went to Lake Genendera College because Canberra has the, the college system for the last two years. I did sort of the TAFE courses, learning video and music production and that kind of thing. And then I, I gave uni a go. I went to Macquarie Uni, um, but found that that wasn't exactly for me. And then, then I just went to the old school of life and, and did everything as it came up. So you, you're a little bit like Sean Williams in that, you know, he went to uni and then he dropped out and became a New York Times best-selling author. And then he went and did his PhD, which kind of is an interesting way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I would. I, I think about that because sometimes I th there's a lot about like doing a PhD and re really investigating a topic and writing a long paper on it. Um, there's quite appealing, and I've got like rough ideas of, of what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, these days with the internet, I'm not sure why I would need to go to uni. I'd probably just prefer to find a, either the, the right people for the topic to, because I, I like getting a beta group to read whatever I. I read and that's almost the same process yeah. but I'd get to choose whatever scientists were appropriate and then go well then I can either put it on the internet or publish it so, yeah so I'm not, I'm not sure I need a PhD no 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 offense to to university but it seems like a long long process and it's a lot slower than I'm used to working yes yeah five years <laughs> to do one one book did you just have a flashback no no I, I am I am a master not a doctor I am an evil villain. Yeah, so I was going to do. Is that a Doctor Who reference? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> okay, so your career has primarily been in the publishing industry. Yes. So, would you like to tell us about that? Because you've done a lot of different things in the publishing well, industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fell into it. Um, I, I just went to a recruitment agency when I was looking for a job, and there was I went and got a job at reception at Hotter Headline. And then they, they went, they were one of the companies that went through a lot of changes. They were taken over by bigger overseas companies, which then changed the Australian company a bit. And so I think I was on reception for three or so months before I then was out the back packing, packing bags, went to the sales reps and working with the publicity team. And then somehow I, I landed, started designing for them. I think one of the designers just asked me to, to look after a bookmark for him. And then, then it sort of went from there, and we, we grew a company just around providing services for um, for the different publishers in Sydney. And so that's been going on. We formed a company up in 2006, so that's like eight years ago now, but we were doing it for about 15 years, I guess, now. 
Zoo Creative. At Zoo Creative. Yep. So we, me and a guy called John McDonald formed uh, Zoo Creative, mm -hmm. um, largely because we both had our own individual clients and we, we kept sharing work whenever one of us was overloaded to eventually we get to that, that point. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, how do you feel about me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's, that's been going since 2006. And a couple years ago, in October again, it's that magic month, we were joined by Rod Morrison. Who, who uh, has been in publishing for a long time as a senior editor and publisher to s develop his own publishing program mm -hmm. under, under his own steam. So that's, what's, that's sort of the, the new direction, as well as Seizure, which I didn't slip in there at all. Yeah, so <laughs> you're, you're listed as a creative director for Zoo Creative yeah. and producer and creative director for Seizure. So yes. what do you do for Seizure? Well, I, and what is Seizure? Seizure is an interesting, well, it's, it's, it's hard to define because people mostly know it as the magazine, in which is its sort of first incarnation, which is like a lot of other lit magazines, it's trying to collect the best of Australian writing, giving people an outlet. Um, but we tried to pair that with our design and photography skills. We were kind of creatively frustrated, so we were like, we were just going to go all out and make something. Um, so we did that in the magazine and we did six issues. But that isn't just what Seizure wants to be. We kind of we're trying to grow into a platform which helps um, all new and existing authors have a bit more, a bit more of a reach than they would by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also trying to grow stepping career stepping stones for people into publishing to get into publishing and develop their role. Because um, while publishing is is a well-meaning industry, it hasn't done much for establishing uh, a career path that people can follow and grow into. When you're talking about getting into publishing, are you talking about people, um, authors getting published or are you talking about people setting up new small press? Um, a little bit of both. Um, so you know it's, there's a lot of people trying to give authors um, and or to find authors an audience and we're, so we're, we're, we're a part of that. But we're also trying to go, if, you're, if you want to be an editor entering the industry then here's some things that you can do to get those necessary CV items. Um, but we've also recently just uh, revealed our second Viva La Novella competition winners and part of that competition was to get four editors to manage a whole project um, and it's kind of in the predict with the prediction that in a few years or even now people can be entrepreneurial publishers they can be part-time spend their time on it um, so it's to give those editors the skills and the confidence that they if they want to go out on their own they can do that they can set up their own un under their own umbrella and go I am Ex I am ex editor publisher, and this is the kind of books I do. So, it's kind of an internship program, then. Yeah, internship by fire. Yeah. But um, it's it's really independent. So we don't have we don't really we don't work out of an office. Mm. It's mainly by email and phone call, and then just taking people through the steps. It's largely I think people just need to just to see be a part of the process once or twice before they actually understand how the sausage is made, and then they can go make their own sausages. Yes, I must admit the thought has crossed my mind that I would like to publish an anthology and the thought of even trying to do a Kickstarter for something like that yeah. is just like, it's too hard. Yeah, so, so my job as producer is basically the how. If somebody wants to do something, I'm the one who has to go, how are we going to do that or how can we do that? Mm. So whether it's how, how do you actually change the HTML on the back end of that website to to make that happen. And it doesn't mean I know everything. I just go and find this person who does know it or, or Google it. <laughs> Google is our friend. Uh, let me Google that for you. <laughs> and then pretend that I knew beforehand. <laughs> does, does using a Mac affect your processes at all? Um, well, the, the Mac environment, it, it kind of does because I, I, I work on the run a lot. So I'm either typing notes into my phone which then automatically syncs or when I had an iPad that worked, I was using the cloud system, so I would write on a document which would then automatically sync. So it would just, it would, using the Mac cloud, I think definitely affected things. It really freed me up. And then sometimes made things a bit messier. Mm. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, discipline my cloud writing. And you've, you've done interviews and podcasts and, and stuff like that. I mean, what has this all been like? It's, it's really interesting. I think it's been good and bad to know sort of what, or have an idea of what was going to happen. Um, but it's, it's also very different to be on, on the other end. So I, I guess I've seen a lot of examples of what works and what doesn't work. And I think I'm trying to be a model of them, trying to be well behaved and do 
whatever's whatever people ask because it's such a hard industry to be a part of. As soon as you make one person miserable for no real reason apart from probably your own insecurity, um, then you've made it a bad trip for everybody. And you know, publishing's terribly paid, so why ruin it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we we've been doing artwork to um, <clears throat> to complement somebody's writing. Mm. Do you actually read their their book or their, uh, yeah. their work? Or um, do you just get a brief? For seizure, we I read it and I talk it over with the editor. Um, and we go with, is this the right direction or the wrong direction? If we're not sure, we'll, we'll usually present two or three options to the author and go, which is the right tone? Because we don't want, we are on the side, we don't really want anything which tells the story, we just want something which, which makes people feel like they're going into the same story that was written. Mm. Um, whereas in the professional world, it's, it's a brief. Um, yeah. And that's a very different operating environment. So mm. I enjoy the, just working with the author and going, is this feeling right for you? It's like, then let's go with it. Zoo has sponsored the Australian Book Industry Book Design Awards, and as well as being the workhorse behind Seizure. Um, how did you get involved with, with sponsoring the um, the Industry Book Design Awards? Um, it was one of those things. Somebody asked me. I, I don't know how many years ago now, since I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody asked me to do the slideshow behind the awards. And then I think we and I think we got paid something tiny, and, and, and so we just went to why don't we just call it sponsorship and we'll work with you. And so we've been doing that for the last few years. Um, this year it's all changed because the APA have uh, separated from the design awards, so it's a new committee, and they're they're, they're starting off anew. It's really really afresh, um, so that'll be a bit different. But we're always there if they need us. Um, yeah, so we so we would then we just continued doing the slides and the AVs and helping out and the sponsor bags and whatnot. Um, and that's always fun to support the industry. Yeah. Yeah. We're well, talking about um, helping people get ahead in what is a difficult industry in transition. Yes, and I mean, it's hard. It's hard because I don't. I, everyone who seems to go into publishing goes into it for very good reasons. Um, but then I think the company structures limit how much change they can do and there, I, I personally don't feel there's been enough uh, research and development going back into their operations. So I mean, if you look at Amazon, they, who I, I know largely seen as the enemy and they've got terrible work practices, but in terms of changing the industry, they have been pumping their money back in. Maybe it's a tax dodge, who knows. But they've been pumping money back in and employing software coders and stuff like that to really work on how people buy products. And they, I, and I'm not the only person to credit them with pushing ebooks and presenting at the world, even though they didn't invent the format. Um, they invented a platform and a distribution chain and started to get people familiar with the new technology. So they've done, they've done a lot for, for change. Um, and publishers just adapt to what's happening which is okay, but um, I think the nature of publishing into the internet world is different than it used to be. It's not just enough to get a, to get a quality book out and into stores. Um, you have to start building some sort of audience that your author can communicate with, and um, not many publishers have invested in that. No. I hope that doesn't get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it seems like there's more and more onus put on the authors to be their own publicity machine. Unless you're an A-list author. Well, even the A-list authors, once, you, once you're in demand, then you are on the treadmill. So it's, it's almost more the, the, the pull from the audience becomes even more demanding than when you're trying to get more attention. So I'm not sure it ever stops. Once you, become, once you, once you succeed in what you were trying to do, then you're probably going to be trying to pull back and go, I've got a wife and children that I want to see. Because um, you look at Hugh Howey and how hard he works, and I think you really have to go maybe that's not right for me. Um, but it's, that's not, I don't think that's publishing's fault, that's the internet and the, the culture of the internet. People want to hear directly from real people now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of a fundamental change. Nobody accepts a company message on any product that it's going to be worth it, that, it's the, that it is the best written thing ever, that it's the, new, the greatest new thing. Nobody believes that, nobody believes, the, nobody believes the blurb on the back. So it's really just, is this author worth listening to? Are they, are they engaging? Do they have any good ideas? 
etc. So I don't know how I don't know how any company can work around that, which is I guess one of the reasons we we with with Seizure we try to give people that little start so they can start engaging with our audience and then cross pollination and hopefully just start to get some sort of practice in the internet sphere and being public because most authors I mean, never practice reading out loud and standing in front of a crowd. We all hate public speaking. So, yeah, it is an interesting game to do how much performance needs to come into being an author now. Um, but I still, but there's still a lot of authors who have come before the end, who have built up their careers before the internet, who can manage to be recluses. I mean, I see nothing from Peter F. Hamilton. Um, it's just like, where is he? I want to meet him. <laughs> see, I'm just, I was just like, yeah, I want to see him. I want to see what he's like because he's, he's somebody I admire. On that note, um, what science fiction and fantasy have you enjoyed? So in teenage years, I, I, oh, I was always reading the Choose Your Own Adventures um, pick a path things. I love the Time Machine series, if, if you know that one. Little silver books, and you get to travel back in time and collect things. Um, so I've always been on a bit of a fantasy science fiction bent there, and, and a little bit of D&D. Star Frontiers, for any any real nerds out there, so that, was the, that was one of the best science fiction worlds ever. Um, then Philip K. Dick and Asimov in that sort of period, and I guess in, I, I definitely, Robert Jordan was fantastic, in, um, right up until book four or five. I've read, I've read, I've read them all, and, and Sanderson really took it home, um, but yeah. yeah I, I heard that there was a, you know, a three book period where it was a bit slow. Three? Okay. That's what I heard. <laughs> and a transition in and out of those three. <laughs> um, but that, that was brilliant world creating. Um, so that, that, that was to be admired. But I think I, I, when, when one goes to uni and that sort of thing, and people, they, uh, I'm not saying science fiction and fantasy isn't as good as literature, because in some ways to me I get a lot more ideas out of it and a lot more connection to what's happening in the world than I do from literature, which seems to be one message at a time, which could be a pamphlet. Take that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, it, but, it, but it took me a while. To, once, once I tapped all the classics, it took me ages to to get back to science fiction. And I came across Stanislaw Lem um, and his master's voice, and that started to regenerate the interest for me in in the genre of because it was just like these are all new ideas of the human condition and the human condition going forward and about how we relate to technology, if there can be aliens, how can we relate to them and all these really philosophical approaches to what was changing. Um, so he, was, he, he really brought me back and now I, can, I feel like I can, I can read almost anything and get something out of it. Um, but Peter F. Hamilton is probably the, for me the contemporary person who's um, really creating big worlds and he's going far, far into the future so he can get away with a lot but he's really imagining what is the human animal going to be like in that period if these technologies happen. So he's a lot of fun. So you're into the really hard science fiction and you're not averse to doorstoppers. Um, Peter F. Hamilton doesn't seem to write short fiction. He does not. Although well, he did do some short stories which, which were pretty good. Um, Manhattan Reverse I think or something like that. Um, I actually am a little averse to the doorstoppers, so it, it takes me a while to build up the time and a period in my life where I'll be able to read something like that. Mm -hmm. I think the golden age was when Philip K. Dick and Asimov, they were, they, what they were writing were novellas, and I, 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 th I think that's actually a better format for most storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I, I'm not such a fan of short stories, I'm not sure, and, and there are many which, which actually grab me, but those shorter 50,000, 70,000 word books where you can actually sit down and have a, a nice weekend read, that's, that's the ideal and I'd, I'd love to see more of that because then it's the writers, especially in science fiction, can just explore the idea and go in it um, and you don't need to flesh out the world entirely. Mm -hmm. So the fantasy sci-fi, you know, wax and yin and yang of the two um, and how the big worlds of fantasy started pushing into the big worlds of science fiction rather than science fiction just going, I've got a great idea, there's an alien, and it's come from another dimension, and, and quickly go through it. So how does this match up with your own books? Because your books are novels, they're not novellas. They are. Well, the history of it is that um, I wrote the, a novella first, which is basically the first 
chunk of book one. And when um, I was originally just going to self-publish, but an editor I had editing it for me sort of sort of showed a couple people, and then then we got to talking and coffee dates and that kind of thing. So was this like the first hundred pages? I think so. Yes. Okay. That big Paris scene. Uh, yes. No, no, the, and yes. the, and then the and the, the little the new more after that. Yes. So that was that was going to be my entry. My original plan was just to self publish and kind of go Marvel World style and follow each character. So then I would have followed Tamsin's character and just told her story for a mm. bit and then see what happens next with Pete and do mm. twenty thousand words here, twenty thousand words there, and just build it up because that would fit in with my mm. my working life better. Um, and I also thought with the ways of the internet it would give time to grow and hopefully build an audience. But the publisher was like, no, nah, it's a trilogy or nothing. So it's like, all right then, trilogy it is. <laughs> so you, you didn't think of structuring it like Nightwatch by Sergei Luka, Lukianenko? Um, no, not exactly. I mean, that one fell off for me. Yeah. I, I, I sort of lost the sense of structure. So, no, I, was gonna, I, I wasn't going to really set an end on my world in that I was definitely going to, I'm going to close off the particular storylines or the, the, the ideas, so talking about psionics at some point, I need to resolve that, so it would, but that would have been explored for each character and seen from different points of view. So it would have been big world stories told in like 20 different chunks or something like that. So that's, that's how I would have gone about it if I was just left to my, you know, left in, in, my, in my room by myself. So it's a little bit like um, the way Anne McCaffrey told the Pern stories because it's like she has the central characters and then you have another book which the time period overlaps and yeah. you might get little cameos yeah. but you're telling somebody else's story. Yeah, and I, and I really like that sort of world building because mm. in some ways when you present one book and you also have the challenge of presenting the whole world, it's almost an impossible task. Mm. I mean, you can't tell about current contemporary Earth in one world and, and, and describe all the small tribes in Africa and South America and, and places that no humans ever been in the same setting so when you if you can if you could chunk it up that way you can actually explore more facets and show that it's a multifaceted yes. world whereas when you present one in one novel it's really quite hard mm -hmm. so you'll find I am jumping a bit mm -hmm. and and that happens even more in the second one just trying to go no this is all the same world and here's a new side of it which you might not have thought about before um, so I, I find that quite a challenge to, to, to give that sense of the, no, this world is as big as our own, if not a little bigger because it stretches into space a little. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I must admit, I haven't finished reading it, but I have got it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they're talking about going off into space, but I'm yeah, not so yeah. sure if somebody's gone into space or not. I'm a bit confused about whether or not Pierre has... Um, <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, it's hard to know with Pierre because there's so much myth around him and he can make people think what he wants. Mm -hmm. So, and even understanding what his motivations are is, is pretty unclear for most of the book. You think you get a handle on it and then he'll do something. It's like, that's, it's, he's a very odd kid, really. Mm -hmm. If kid he is. Um, but yeah, I, I like to, to drop those hints in. So, um, you know, 20 years from now, I, I hope people will be able to read books, the, these, these early books, and go, he did drop a hint about this story that's going to happen on the moon at some point, because I've just got a reference to, I think, I think this could be in, in book three, where somebody refers to the, a section of the moon as being completely lawless, and so it's like, yep, I'm going to tell that story. So it's just, it'll just be one line here and there and there, and say, yeah, I, I know what that, what's happening over that bit of the world. So while it's a trilogy, you're thinking actually longer term and, and possibly more books to develop yeah. as well? I mean, I, mean I, I want to assure everybody that the, you know, the story resolves. It's not going to be one of the endless, fan, the endless and, and, yeah, the never ending <laughs> stories. Um, it's going to resolve, but you know, I'm not going to kill everyone on the planet. So that's all, there, there are more stories to continue. Um, and there's a lot of themes which I've introduced, which I think could be a lot of fun to play with like they start to I don't know if you're up to the bit where they start rejuvenating or they start talking about people becoming young again and I think that's it's 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 an extension of what's happening now as people get older um, not the people getting older and never being able to retire but if you could be young again then you're actually going to have this second generation of people who which completely dominate the first lifers and Peter of Hamilton has played with this a lot um, and I so I'd like to explore that the early days where 
that second lifers have a uh, unshakable cultural domination and what how that affects the world. Not unlike baby boomers dominating Generation X. Not unlike that at all. Not that we would know anything yeah. about being Generation X in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I, again, I think about that in companies as well. Companies that outlive individuals and how they actually cross generations and it's kind of a strange thing because there's no period of renewal. Even if they've become redundant, those, those megaliths still exist and have a huge effect, even though they might not be appropriate to the environment anymore. So, I mean, because we are still um, bound by the structures that were created for World War II. Um, and that's really guided the entire world economy and in, in the way the countries are in, interact now. Um, because maybe bigger isn't better, and also the, you know, the infinite capitalism, the infinite growth. It's like, um, it's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure somebody once told me you cannot create or destroy matter, so you're going to run out. Yes, the economists seem to have, you know, they seem to think that sustainability is a dirty word because it must be expanding. Yes. And infinite expansion is not sustainable. Yeah. And we will continue to grow our population until it gets to that soil and green level where we're going to have dump trucks collecting people and just you know, out you go. Um, if, we, if, we don't, if, if we don't curtail our behaviour, then that's probably what's going to happen. It's, we've already, we already get to see pictures, disturbing pictures. If we're that way inclined, we can look on the internet or watch any sort of charity uh, ad and see that kind of thing. So, yeah. There's, there's things to be wary of for the future. Mm. How did um, the Hunt Pierre Jr. Uh, follow on from Terence Bumbley's adventures? Um, well, Terence Bumbley is, I think he's set a couple centuries after, because mm. uh, the world does kind of connect. Um, I'm not sure the same readers who like Pierre Jr. will like Terence Bumbley because I don't know if you haven't read it, he's, he's a Bumbley old man and he's just sort of remembering stuff and he's, he's largely amused by the world. He's, he's, a, he's not a crotchety old man, maybe curmudgeonly, but he just goes around and is amused by, hey, that's strange and these people are odd and, and he likes to write about that sort of thing. And um, so the, the museum started with, as uh, the museum book started after a, an exhibition of drawings I did. I did eight drawings of just strange things that had come to mind and my dad told me to put it into a book. So then I think I created 40 more drawings, something like that, and created a tiny little, you know, like the plaque next to them on the wall to say this is what this is, this is what this is, and then we put it into a, into a book. Um, and Pierre Jr. was one of the original eight. I'm not a great believer in telepathy and psionics in the real world, though I, I think there's a lot of weird stuff that happens that we don't get to explain. My natural bent is to go, well, there must be a scientific explanation. Um, but then every time they do a test for these things, they just get random samples of people. And so, and so I sort of extrapolate, I go, well, if you wanted to see how fast humanity could run, you wouldn't just go grab a few, few people off the street you start doing the Olympics and you, you start training people. So it was that premise that, okay, let's find the people who are strongest in these abilities or claim that they're strongest in the abilities and work them out and, and build an institute. And then, so it was sort of reverse engineering. That was, the, that was what sort of was talked about in the Museum of Unnatural History. And then, and then Pierre and then Pierre was the, was the unfortunate but natural result of a, a hotbed of sexual activity in this what is it, like an Olympic uh, village and and with cross with drugs and the strange genetic modifications that have happened to humanity by that time so eventually a baby appeared that was out of control and you're still like you're now in this position as being an author who is actually out there supporting other authors Yes. How does this dual relationship work? I don't know. I get quite a lot of joy from helping other authors. Mm. Um, I've because I've I've got to work with big and big and small authors for for a long time now, and helping people just get over those stumbling blocks in the beginning and get their work out there and improve their work and help talk them through what it's like. I get a lot of joy from that. Has it helped you as an author? 
Uh, I don't think so yet. I've made a lot of friends that way, and that yeah. actually, so you know, the moral support has been great. Yes. Um, and I'm starting to find some other science fiction authors that we can we can bond and, and have our little nerd outs together. Because, but even though it's amazing how many people you talk to and they go they love science fiction, it's like you do. <laughs> Let's be friends. <laughs> we were at the Emerging Writers Festival last week. We we were giving free tickets to the pitch. And at the end, I made some comment about science fiction. All of a sudden, I had this group of people around <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's coming back because. There was that period where the world was changing faster than science fiction was, mm. and so it, the genre, I think, stumbled a bit, or you know, we just weren't keeping up with what's going to happen. Um, so now I think we're catching up with. We've got to, where we feel a bit more free to extrapolate to the future world, um, because I don't think even in the, in the golden age they weren't really thinking about that hyperconnectivity, which we're starting to discover in our everyday lives. They, 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 had a, they talked about a lot of great philosophical and technological issues, but actually what's happened is like, well, there's some new stuff to talk about, and it's, and it's species changing. So, yeah. We're living in this world changing. Time. Everything's changing. Oh, kind of almost reluctant to use the word climate with Obama on one hand and Tony Abbott on the oh. other, but it's, you know, it's an amazing era we're living in. It is, and makes so it's, I am... Um, I, I, I uh, set Pierre about 150 years from now, and there is a time of apocalypse between now and then. And I always go with the, theory, with the understanding that apocalypse is actually not the end of the world, it's just the end of an age. So it's like, okay, so let's presume that this age ends, and how is it going to end? You refer to it as the latest dark age. Yes, I call it either the second dark age, or and some people call it the collapse, because it was, um, I don't know if you know, know the, the term self-organizing criticality. It's so basically a pile of sand can only get so high before it collapses and forms a new base. And it's that kind of thing. As we continue to build a population and we continue to create these new ways of interacting, at some point that original base structure, which was probably formed in the last century, is not going to sustain that level of interaction. So there probably will come some period of adjustment. Whether that's going to result in bloodshed or not, I think is up to people's sense of being civil and humane to each other. But um, unfortunately, we've got so many different kinds of people. No, fortunately, we have so many different kinds of people in the world that there probably will be bloodshed. So that I can't, I can't say it's been that positively, can I? It's good to have diversity in all kinds, but unfortunately, that's going to lead to conflict. Yes. Um, and so then I, so I have this this second dark age where there's all the, all the wars, all the bad things that you can imagine technology. Uh, doing and which has been the tropes of science fiction for a while, like having the grey goo. Yep, definitely, they went through a grey goo period. We are going to have automated robots out there killing. I mean, they're programmed by humans, so that's what's going to happen. And it's already started. It's, it's started. I don't know if you've heard about the drones at the start, and I've heard that the Russians have may have crossed the line on giving um, firing control, automatic firing control, to a machine. There's some tanks with some guns mounted on them, patrolling some area, and there's a there's a sign well, saying no uh, be, be, "Beware the killer tanks." Um, and it's and I don't know if anyone would see that sign and take that as a joke, but yeah, there's not necessarily a human who has to say yes, fire. It's it can be it's and some, sign it. It's on its way. Well, yes, because in some way that's there's always going to be somebody who's going to do it, mm -hmm. and so it's, so it was it's, so that collapses that we're going to get bigger and bigger. Our powers over our environment keep increasing. Our powers over our own bodies keep increasing. So there's going to be DIY genetics. And it's like, yep, I can totally see there'll be a certain proportion of the population who will have no problem experimenting on their kids or other people's kids, <laughs> preferably other people's kids. And that will, cr that will create a huge crisis situation around the world. Now, that, thus, I have like this 50-year blackout from our time to the time of Pierre. And then you get the, a lot more horror stories. I hope to do some short stories in that, in that world at some point. Yeah. Well, it would be really interesting to, to read them. Yeah. Oh, just thinking about what, what you're saying, it's like 25 years ago people were talking about designer babies. And, yeah. And, and it hasn't gotten simpler since then. No, and people, it's, it's good that the ethical issues are always debated and discussed. But there seems to be a, um, 
a drive, which I don't know if it's coming from people, but or it's just the inevitability of once the technology makes something possible, then it becomes a choice. And then even once that choice has been made, there will come an instance where they go, isn't it in the best, um, isn't the best result going to be that we actually do interfere in the natural processes? And I think humanity left what was natural as an animal behind a long, long time ago. So do we either revert back to rubbing two sticks together for fire, or do we continue in this direction? I'm, I follow, I fucking love science. Oh, yes. And this yeah. morning, there was a thing on it about humankind being a domesticated animal. Mm -hmm. Because we were wild hunters and gatherers and yep. everything, and then somehow or other, we domesticated ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> We really have. We've entirely changed our environment. We have established ways of living and all that it goes all through our lives and, and, and practices and the clothing which protects us. And so while it's empowered us, what has it done in, in reverse? But then again, would we want to be wild cavemen with, that, with, with thoughts that just went everywhere? And Lord of flies. That's right. Anarchy is only going to last a moment before it becomes survival of the fittest. Mm. And so at, I, I actually lean more on the side of civilization. In some ways, look, we're here now. Mm. Um, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, this system's, this system's not perfect. Let's toss it out. Mm. We, we, I think we have all the tools to make positive change and fix a lot of our problems. It's just getting the will of, of, of the people together to actually make those things happen. And, Yes, a lot of that is then get into that diversity question of a diversity of opinions, what, what is right and wrong. And managing a society of individuals. Yes, a mass society of individuals. Because if you, there's, cause the people are trying to come up with this natural number of human group, like the Dunbar number I think it is, and it's like 150 people. I'm not exactly sure how they came to this number. But I think a lot of companies are starting to go, yeah, 150, that's a, that's a pretty good number. Because beyond that, you lose the quality of communication. And so then it starts to filter out. So can we have a global society where actually the human animal was, is designed for a, a much smaller group? We do have it, so yeah, in some ways we do. So. <laughs> well, human high, human K is, um, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah? I've, I've, I've interviewed it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> I've met him, but I haven't actually interviewed him. Um, but yeah, but he talks about people wanting to live in villages and people living in herds and people yeah. going to coffee shops because they want to be in herds, even if they're having coffee on their own, mm. be in the herd. Yeah, and because unfortunately when you, when you don't exist in the herd, it's too easy to be between herds and be isolated and you know we get to see a lot of the, that loneliness and what that results in so uh, can the human animal change into something else and can we, then can we have digital herds are they as satisfying I don't know um, I think I was reading about that this morning and just talking about can it actually translate to online feeling sense of, of knowing each other and stuff like Because there's a lot of criticism of Facebook and other social media for pushing people apart, but I don't know if it's actually just they are meeting the needs of society who was maybe quiet before, you know, and so is it giving people a chance to actually connect with people like them and give them a sense of belonging, even if that person's on the other side of the world, then that's, that's a valuable tool. Um, so in some ways I think it's just a, it's a facilitator of, of what people are desiring rather than the cause of it. Quick what you're basically saying is social media is like fire. It's a great servant and a bad master. Yes, that's it's not bad. I mean, yeah, it is what we make of it. And, we, and I think a lot of the times, even though we're part of things, we forget that actually it's all in human control. We've made up everything. Yeah. So we could remake it up a little if we just tried. Okay, well, come, just coming back in for the. Yeah. I have one more question. Now I'm no longer being Pierre Junior. Um, the hats on, continuity's gone. Oh, CJ asks, who do you think would win, Kirk versus Picard in a game of Trivial Pursuit? Yeah, I've been thinking about this, and it's, it's I think it's, it's a tough one. But because I've been rewatching the original Star Trek, for the first, well, I've been watching it for the first time, and Kirk is actually pretty impressive. He really intuits things out, and he's great in a situation. 
but I think a three wheel pursuit would have to be Picard. Mm. He studied a lot more history, so he would just have to win. Whereas Kirk, in a, in, a, in a crisis situation, I would pick Kirk. If we were playing, if it was Picard versus Kirk and Risk, I think I'd choose Kirk. Kirk's more of a John Wayne, and Picard's more. Face. Yeah, but I'm re-watching now, and he's actually, he does, when he has to go, he gets forced into a lot of difficult situations, but he asks the appropriate people, and then he weighs his decisions up. I think, you know, a lot of governmental people could, could learn from Kirk, and still, still be a proud cowboy, and yet ask your scientific advisor. <laughs> well, thank you very much thank for you very much. to Dark Matter. It's been great. It's been lovely to meet you both and all. <laughs>